Friends, UQ wins this debate by proving that this language is likely to be less inclusive, lead to less support for the movement, and lead to worse end goals. And unfortunately for those opposite, that was UQ won today. I'm going to do four things in this speech. Firstly, tell you what this imagery is likely to look like. Secondly, tell you why it's going to be incredibly un uh, in exclusive. Thirdly, tell you why it reduces support for the movement. And fourthly, tell you why it leads to worse and less Im uh, likely to be successful end goals. Firstly, on setup. Observe that because this is a debate about support, side negative does not get to pick and choose what types of this imagery they like. They need to prove that they're likely to get what they want. Why do we think it's likely to be fairly problematic imagery? We think it's likely to be imagery that does things like have chants about like no uterus, no opinion. It looks like imagery of things such as like uteruses on like placards and billboards. Uh, it looks like uh, chants about things such as like female pleasure during sex, particularly referencing like uh, cisgender female biological processes. Why do we think it's likely to be done in a bad way? Two reasons. Firstly, this debate is set at protests, and we think that protests are particularly a time when people are likely to be fairly, A, fueled with anger, and B, in, uh, protests often happen in a very reactionary manner to things that have just happened. They're unlikely to be particularly forward-looking or talking about very nuanced, per, uh, like, uh, sort of like forward-looking legislative change. So they're likely to be extreme and vulgar and without any particular reason behind that. Secondly, note that just most feminists are likely to be cisgender and likely white, given these feminist protests are more likely to be able to safely occur in progressive and like developed nations. Two reasons. Firstly, just by pure number, but uh, like in terms of most women in the world are cisgender women. But secondly, it's far more comparatively likely that they feel able to opt into the movement under the status quo due to like systemic reasons such as like trans-exclusive ra radical feminism that have excluded uh, non-cisgender women uh, and other gender minorities from accessing those spaces. So they're less likely to be able to opt in even to the extent to which uh, that they feel comfortable being out in the world. So I think that what this means is that these, these trends are likely to be insensitive to both A, what is best long-term for the movement, but secondly, to non-cisgender women and they're likely to be fairly exclusive. On that, first point of substantive, why this is likely to be not inclusive. Firstly, just observe that pot posters are likely to be exclusionary in how they are likely to refer to like bi the biological sex of women. It, uh, I gave some examples in my, in my introduction about things such as like no uterus, no opinion chants, which are obviously very exclusive to people that identify as women but do not possess a uterus. But even if they're likely to be done comparatively well and they're not likely to be as directly trying to be offensive, the mere fact that they need to reference things such as biological sex as the forefront of the movement, as what people hear in chants when they walk down the street, as what they hold up on signs that people will see on news shows later, messages society that that is what it means to be a woman and that is what it means to be a feminist. This is harmful because it, because it alienates, alienates people from their sense of self. The way that you experience your gender is, an, is a fundamental way that you experience your identity. It's something that you experience every day internally, both, at, both in like yourself and in reference to other people. And that means that the idea that feminism would actively try uh, and tell you that that was not legitimate was likely to be quite harmful to you. But secondly, you're likely to feel quite betrayed because feminism was a movement that was telling, but that was normally supposed to be telling people that they cared about the safety of women. But it was specifically not helping transgender women, which was incredibly problematic because it also meant that you were alienated from a space that you expected to feel safe. Four reasons why you should weigh this as the most important thing in this debate. Firstly, the vulnerability of these women was far greater than cisgender women, particularly when these protests were likely to be happening in otherwise fairly developed nations. Secondly, this was likely to affect them the most deeply in this debate. This attacks their very sense of self. Thirdly, we believe that the movement ought to be intersectional, and it is a principled harm that it would not be in this debate. But fourthly, being a, the failure to be intersectional is likely to interact with all of the other clashes in this debate. That is to say that the alienation of transgender women was likely to lead to less support because they were less able to opt in, and it was likely to lead to worse goals of that movement because those voices were incredibly valuable in informing what sort of um, a, a policy changes the movement should support more broadly. At that point, we went on that clash, and I think that is a way in which we can win the debate in, by that alone. Moving on then to the other clashes in, in, this, in this speech and the other points of substantive. Firstly, on why we get more support. I've already told you in regards to how this is more inclusive in regards to it, it's, it's less likely to alienate uh, non-cisgender women, but I think additionally it's less likely to alienate people that specifically would join the movement for these non-cisgender women. I believe this is likely to be lots of people who do not identify as women but do identify as queer in other ways and are likely to have lots of friends that fall like outside of the gender binary or are likely to be uh, or just people that happen to not know many uh, people who happen to specifically care quite deeply about those kind of issues those are people that are likely to be big allies of transgender rights and they're more likely to support feminism if they feel that feminism is also more likely to be exclusive
but I, or, and it's less likely to be explicit. Secondly, I think that this imagery empowers conservatives for a number of reasons. Because this language is likely to be fairly exclusive and vulgar, even at best, it's likely to be perceived as things that are sort of inappropriate, it's likely to be weaponized as being inappropriate for a public forum. Talking about things such as sex positivity is likely to be something that the majority, uh, that, men, that conservatives are, are going to weaponize as proving that like these movements are unsafe for kids or things like that. Why is this important? Because conservatives are obviously going to hate feminism under both sides, but the extent to which that narrative that they're, and the rhetoric that conservatives are likely to use is going to be conducive to also persuading moderates to believe the conservatives is a key point of difference in this debate. The ability for conservatives to say that these chants and these movements are unsafe for kids is quite compelling to moderates, moderates who often have kids of their own. But comparatively, if the, if the, if the alternative is people age fem is our feminist protests, not talking directly about like sex traits, but talking about things such as, for example, like d d not controlling women's bodies. That is something that's far more palatable and far more likely to have moderates be on side. That's important just because of the scale of the number of people that that's likely to be and, and when they were able to like vote with their feet at the ballot box. I think this is quite important. But additionally, this is likely to shift the narrative towards things such as transphobia and away from other issues that I think, uh, and uh, from like other legislative issues that I think means it's able to be weaponized by conservatives. The impact of this is that when we were able to get more support, we were able to get more people to A, just show up at protests in the first place. This created the appeal of, of impetus ad letter for like legislative change. It also meant we were more likely to get people to vote for policies that were likely to align with the goals of the feminist movement that was likely to have legislative capability. At that point, moving on to the third point of substantive as to why we get better end goals of the movement. The importance of this is to believe that even if you believe that they somehow got more support, it was likely to be support that created less practical change. Why was this? Firstly, I think just the fact that this narrative equates womanhood to their sex characteristics is in principle bad for the movement because it feeds into narratives that have been used to oppress women for generations. So like the purpose of womanhood is to be like a child rearer. I think it's bad to feed into those kind of narratives. Secondly, it shifts the goals of the movement away from sort of tangible legislative possibilities and into a sort of culture war. Even if that's not the intention of the movement, it is inevitably what happens when you allow conservatives to weaponize this rhetoric. It means that you're less likely to be able to fight directly for legislative change because you are talking, uh, because you are not talking, uh, because your chants are not about that, they're instead just about biological processes. Thirdly, it's likely to be less intersectional, and I flagged this in my first point, but this is incredibly important. Because those people are the most vulnerable, they're also the people that are therefore most affected by legislative change. You're likely to get the biggest form of legislative change when they are able to have people on side. They're also able to just broaden the feminist movement's understanding of how people experience womanhood within society and are able to advocate for more uh, intersectional policies. At the end of this speech, what we proved to you is foremost, this is an exclusive kind of narrative that's likely to alienate lots of people. The impacts of that were that we got more support under our side, we got more better, uh, more and better policy under our side, so proud to propose. I thank the first family for that fine speech, and I now welcome the first negative speaker to open the case for Neg Bench. Here, here. <laughs> start with the characterization that is woefully unresponded to by a negative team. Because we tell you, these movements do get taken over by turfs for two reasons. One, cis people make up the majority of the population of these countries and the majority of the population of these movements. And they are also the people that have the most access to capital within these movements because they have not been historically oppressed by these societies. They do not feel as disenfranchised in attending these protests as trans women or intersectional, uh, intersectional people or you know, uh, trans men in attending these protests. But by their own analysis, at the end of that speech, TERFs are incredibly powerful people in these movements who have the ability to really undercut the feminist movement's ability to achieve its goals, which is the very argument they make, which by that logic means that TERFs are the ones controlling these movements, and that is why this is likely to be done in an exclusive way. That is why the majority of this imagery is likely to be about biologically female sexual characteristics in a way that is particularly exclusive to trans women in a way that is particularly exclusive to trans men or intersex people. The second thing we tell you is that people at these protests are incredibly emotive and angry. And that is not to say that they do not have policy goals in mind, 
but rather that they're not thinking about the end goals of their actions when they are taking these steps. They're not thinking about what will get best support for the movement when I go out to this protest. They are thinking, I am angry. I'm going to do the first thing that comes to my mind as an emotional response. And that is why they are likely to do this in ways that are particularly visceral, in ways that un undermine the support for the movement, which got no response by this team, by the way, and in ways which particularly alienate people because they use the most vulgar imagery that, uh, that sets people offside. That means, at the very best case for us, this imagery is actively, massively exclusionary and harms trans women in particular. At very best case for them, it is insensitive because it's done in a way that is not caring about the way the trans women interact or perceive this imagery. So, the next thing they say is, well, these protests are enhanced by this. And this is where their case really falls apart. Because we tell you from first affirmative, there are alternatives to doing this. You do not need to use visceral imagery. You can say this is about not having women's bodies controlled by men without using depictions of female like sexual characteristics. You can say this is about like a woman's right to choose without particularly like portraying a uterus or portraying a clitoris in that protest. This is effective because you can lo like lobby both moderates on our side and you can use the same sort of narrative about control that they want to weaponize on their side. That is why we win the characterization. Let's then talk about inclusivity. The first thing they say is that, well, this desensitizes people to women's bodies and that is bad because they've uh, been historically oppressed for their bodies. A few responses. Firstly, this is something that is trending to get better over time anyway because of the fact that the feminist movement is successful in a lot of spheres, which means that they have a very low impact in the debate anyway. And that is because the feminist movement has historically been really good at advocating for these types of things without using sexualized imagery. By just improving men's understanding of consent, which you do not need sexualized imagery or depiction of biological sexual characteristics to do. But secondly, this importantly stigmatizes trans people and their bodies because you are going to a protest where the depiction of what is womanhood is the front and foremost of this protest and is showing you pictures of people's like breast, pictures of their clitoris, pictures of their uterus and that is what you internalize and perceive as what it means to be a woman which means that even if it is not intended by the people that are running these protests to be offensive or exclusionary it is internalized as exclusionary because that is what you understand as womanhood and that is incredibly important because these are the most vulnerable people they have incredibly uh, vulnerable self identities which have been oppressed for so long, we think it is important that they have access to their identity under our side. This is the team that shut them out. We told you that, uh, yeah, uh, oh yeah, they say you can discuss it, uh, you can discuss like sexual characteristics without associating them with gender. They don't give explanation of this, right? They don't give an explanation of why this is likely to be true. And the next thing they say is this robs trans women of talking about their biological sex. Firstly, that is reliant on them doing it in a good way, which I've already disproven is unlikely to be the case. But secondly, even if there are some trans women that feel able to do this, they are the ones that are the minority of this movement. So when this movement is depicted in media or, and, or like broadcast on social media online, the people receiving this movement, like the trans women at home that are watching these protests, the things that they see are the biologically female sexual characteristics that then alienate them. So the inclusivity stance harm still stands. All of the arguments we gave you from first affirmative that flow as a result still stand. Why did we say that that was the most important thing in the debate? Firstly, in terms of vulnerability, they are the most vulnerable people. Secondly, in terms of scale, because it affects them the most because they have an important connection to their self-identity. Thirdly, in terms of principle, it was important for these movements to be intersectional, especially when they had locked out people like trans people and intersex people for such a long time, and because these were the people whose policy changes were most important for, because they were decades behind cis women in terms of policy outcomes. For example, intersex people regularly still at birth or you know when they are very young have surgeries performed on them without their consent to remove like parts of their sexual identity which is incredibly harmful to them and that is policy that lags decades behind lastly we told you it is important because it flows onto the other impacts in the debate because you get more support when you have more inclusion of trans people you get better end goals of the movement when trans people are able to tell you what is important to them and what goals are important what do they say here? They say there is a right to talk about your bodies. One, you still get to do this under our side. You still get to talk about your bodies in other forums like the internet. We think that the protests that they 
say, empowers conservatives on that side. But we also told you there are alternatives, like talking about why it's so important for a woman to have access to her body without necessarily depicting it in the way that the negative team wants to say. And thirdly, we told you this buys into historical narratives that ties women to their bodies, which says that being a woman is related to your sexual characteristics. And that was principally bad because it bought into the narratives that conservatives were still weaponizing today, and also practically bad because it alienates the people who were opposed to those narratives, the feminists that bought into that theory and therefore think, thought that those things were bad. Let's then talk about support. They say this undermines support for the movements, but they, uh, sorry, they say it undermines support for the movement because you need this visual imagery. They do no work to prove why this visual imagery is actually effective at getting the change and support that they want. What did we tell you on our side? We told you that conservatives particularly pick up on this imagery because they say it is incredibly vulgar. They say this is not appropriate for children. And when you are protesting in a public forum, they say this is the feminist movement gone mad. They do not know what they are doing and they are harming vulnerable children. That is importantly narrative of conservatives that hits well with moderates because a lot of conservative narratives about the feminist movement do not hit particularly well, especially if the women, women are advocating for rights to their own bodies. It is difficult for moderates to see why that is a bad thing. But when they can see that uh, the feminist movement is using vulgar depictions of clitoris, I don't know what the plural of a clitoris is, clitori, uh, in public forums, that hits more with moderates. Moderates who have children of their own who are more likely to think that this is inappropriate and less likely to side with the feminist movement. We also told you about the importance of inclusion and particularly allies. That was incredibly important. Their response is, well, you anger TERFs. But if TERFs are so powerful that when you anger them, they're bad, why are they empowering TERFs on their side to control these movements? We think if it is true that TERFs are powerful, we must oppose them prima facie and lock them out of these movements by saying you should not be able to do this in the first place. We think, at that point, you always anger them on their side anyway, because you always have trans women trying to come into these places. The best case for their side, like presumably, is not having trans women in these spaces so you do not anger turfs. Obviously, that is not good for the reasons we've already given you about why the goals of this movement are so important. Lastly, very briefly, they never respond to why it is important to have intersectional goals for these movements, why that creates the best policy changes, and why they alienate women on their side. Queensland takes this round. I thank the second affirmative speaker for their fine speech, and I now welcome the second negative speaker to, to continue the case for the next bench. He here. I think it's a ridiculous characterization that TERFs and cis women in general are mostly TERFs, right? You think cis women are probably quite intersectional in terms of being able to support other movements because they have been oppressed. They know how it feels like to be oppressed. So they're probably going to be pretty sympathetic towards other movements within this debate. I'm not sure this characterization of, oh, most women are cis women, thus most of them are TERFs, are very convincing in this debate. Three things I'm going to do in this debate. Firstly, on framing. Secondly, on how we get more support for the feminist movement. Lastly, on how we get better support for trans women. Okay, firstly, on framing. They tell us that this imagery is likely to be fairly problematic because I uh, think this is set up process um, and people are angry. We already tell you at Zoe that this is probably going to be targeted towards specific problems that exist, like things like abortion, but this is also going to be things that likely target trans women as well, right? Things like sexual assault and things like that that a trans woman can also get involved in. But also, if people are going to be really upset on both sides, they're probably going to demonize other things as well, right? Because the people being upset is symmetrical. We get to externalize that by talking about these uh, these reproductive things and these women's 
uh, women's health in general, but we think in, in this in this fear, uh, this anger is externalized in other ways outside affirmative. Things like demonizing people external to the movement, i.e. talking about how much you hate men within your chairs. That looks like having significantly more backlash from the conservative point they want to have, they want to talk about so much. But secondly, at the point at which there's no way to externalize, we think there's other worst alternatives, things like violence, things like protest. We think that's going to be obviously worse, right? Okay, let's talk about cis people not being TERFs. Note how cis people, trans, uh, TERFs are currently exclusionary to the movement because most people support trans women within the movement, right? Like to the extent that most people support trans women, they won't let TERFs into the movement or like take over the movement because of the simple fact that they support trans women and they're sympathetic of the things that they say. We already tell you that they're probably going to be pretty empathetic about rights of trans women at Zoe, but we don't really hear a response to other other than the fact that, oh, these people are cis and these people are privileged or white, so they're going to be inherently terse. Okay, and I think the last thing to say in framing is that this exists along with other imagery in the movement, right? Obviously, some feminist issues are going to be exclusionary to people within the feminist movement. That is to say, like, abortion is probably exclusionary when you chant about abortion. It's probably going to be exclusionary to people who are infertile. What does this mean, then? That when you, it, it, like, it doesn't mean that when you talk and yell about bodily autonomy and abortion, this doesn't mean that, like, the feminist movement is saying that women are... are, are women without fertility or women who are infertile are not necessarily women. It probably means that they're, they're talking about specific issues that affect a certain group of the feminist movement. In the same way, when you have these imagery, you're probably talking about certain groups that are affected by a certain part of the feminist movement, right? That is to say that it's probably not going to be as dehumanizing as Side Affirmative says. It's because this is, exists in things, in part of other things in the debate because of the fact that it doesn't attack their identities. It's talking about, oh, this, this issue probably supports some specific people in the debate. But even if they are, we think they're only going to be feeling excluded for a certain amount of time because you're going to talk about other things as well. Because you're seeing and hearing issues that affect them as well when you're talking about things like sexual assault, when you're talking about other things in this debate that allow them to feel included within feminist movements and rallies. Okay, let's talk about why we got on the more support for the feminist movement then. They tell us firstly that they, that they alienate people who are queer and that people who are queer no longer support the feminist movement. Okay, note this firstly then. It, the, note how this it, it mitigates a significant amount of their harms about the, like the protest being used so badly and being so exclusionary. If there are so many people that care about the trans, trans people within the feminist movement, such that like the feminist movement is so weakened at the point at which you are harming trans people, then then it probably means there are a decent group of people within the feminist movement that care about uh, trans people as a whole. This means that like, you're probably not going to have TERF take on a movement like they say, and this mitigates a lot of their argumentation about this being inherently exclusionary because the people within the movement and people at the rallies, even if they are yelling things that may be like, slightly exclusionary, are people that accept trans people as a whole because of their, fl because of their like, characterization that oh, there's so many people who are queer within the feminist movement and they're no longer going to support women and that's such a large impact. But secondly, note how the queer community has historically supported by communities that have been open about sexuality, right? This looks like Mardi Gras rallies and like connection with the BDSM movement. This means that like the queer community will be quite accepting of the imagery that exists and the support uh, the support that exists because of it. Okay, and let's talk about conservative opposition. So we already told you that this. this that there's always, there's always going to be a vulgar and angry chance, and this is go going to be like harmful towards, harmful towards the image of the feminist movement in general. But secondly, we think even if that's not the case, feminist movement is the is the movement that has the most resources to fight back against conservative, uh, conservative backlash because it is the, one, of the, one of the biggest social movements. This looks like you know, being able to include the most number of past people because it's like the 50% of people in the world. But secondly, the historical success and the length of the feminist movement are able to fight back. So at the point at which Fox News is attacking feminist movements instead of LGBTQ movements or other progressive movements, it's probably much better uh, to the extent that feminist movement is a lot less likely to be harmed due to their strength. So at the end of this, we'd probably rather like conservative media attack the feminist movement than other types of movements due to the intersectionality that exists and their ability to defend themselves due to their resources. 
Okay, let's talk about reproductive health and stigma because I don't think this gets really responded to very well by Cormac. Because we tell you in this debate, this is the only way you get women to show up to rally. This is the exclusive tipping point at which women are going to be as motivated as possible. Why is it the case? Because one, historical oppression and deep women have been historically not allowed to talk about taboo topics like their genitals, like their, uh, like, um, like their genitals, right? But secondly, we think they are shamed in terms of women because they're able to talk and act about certain things in the protest that they otherwise would not have been able to do with the on-site of feminism. This means that women are more likely to be able to talk about the things that they want to with this debate, and we talk about all the benefits that we gain to you about things like education and things about, about our sex, reproductive health and the stigma that reduces because you're going to have people who are more exposed to this, who are more exposed to sexual things within this debate, right? But thirdly, we think a lot more women are likely to be supported because of the visceral imagery that to explain how oppressed they are and think that to explain things that have directly viscerally impacted them of things like sexual assault that needs visceral imagery to explain these things because of the very fact that the, the harm that that because of the very fact that the harm they have accrued is quite visceral to them. So they need to externalize this emotion in a way that is quite visceral uh, towards other people, right? Let's talk about weighing them. We think obviously we're able to benefit a lot, a lot, more, a lot of women on our side as well. And to the extent that there are quite a lot of women in the debate that are being benefited by the feminist movement. But secondly, we think trans women are also benefiting from the quite a lot of issues that support women as well. To the extent that trans women are likely to be sexual assaulted at a higher, higher likelihood rate. To the extent that you get protection about sexual assault for women, you're probably going to protect trans people as well. Okay, let's talk about trans people within this debate. Because we, I think, I think they're not, not likely to get policy outcomes for trans people on their side as well. Because obviously, we give you this analysis at Zoe, where like, trans people need the trans movement because they are, they are at a different stage of progressivism than the feminist movement. To the extent that feminist movements are not pushing forward for exclusively trans rights, are doing so for women's rights, this probably, this probably has different, uh, different goals in terms of the movement. So you're probably not going to get the policy outcomes that like AF is, AF is talking about their side. But, but I think trans women are able to benefit as a whole because we are able to pass policy that benefits women and that inherently benefits feminist, um, trans women. At the end of the day, we're able to, we're on the side that benefits trans women the most. That's the first. <laughs>
Let me prove to you three things. Firstly, on inclusivity, the narratives around trans women and this kind of thing. Observe that this is the debate-winning material we give to you because the harms are so massive. Then I'll prove to you stuff about support of the movement, and finally, that we get better out of, that the policy we get from the movement is much, much better, material that they don't engage in. Okay, firstly, let's talk about yeah, inclusivity. I think they miss a lot of the point of this argument when they try and frame it as like some kind of principled thing about including people in the right way and stuff like that. The real point of this argument is that trans people do not have very many safe spaces in the world and that they need to go and fight for their rights all the time and that if we can prove that trans people are unlikely to attend these rallies, they do not feel safe at these rallies, that you exclude them from a movement that does do things that are good for them and like note that the trans movement does not fight for abortion rights very much and the feminist movement does, that is, things that, that is a policy that does affect a lot of trans men. I think the impact of that then is that like they, they, they miss the, the real thrust of this argument that we've given you down the bench. What do they give us in response then? Firstly, they tell us that this, like, this imagery is not gender essentialist um, and that like feminists are not likely to be transphobic and all of these kind of things. The problem with this is that it does not matter what the intention of feminists are because it is about how trans people perceive the rhetoric that they see. And I think they perceive this rhetoric in a way, especially in a world in which they are told that they should be gender conforming and stuff like that, that bodies matter most and that what your like anatomy is, is what is what like corresponds to your identity, especially when like the feminist movement uses that, and puts that on a sign to amplify that as the site of oppression, right? They tell the, like the audiences of their protest that this is the site of, of like feminist oppression as they tell us in their, in their principle material, right? I think the impact of that then is this is about trans people taking it in a way that perhaps it wasn't attended. But we also tell you that there are many, many people in the feminist movement who are transphobic. They tell you that turfs are powerful. We tell you they get much more vocal under their side of the house because you give them all of the rhetoric that they already believe in and you make all of the other feminists who are transphobic also use that rhetoric, right? So at that point, I think you amplify the transphobic voices within the community. Trans people feel very, very unsafe there. They tell us that, oh, well actually we silence trans women under our side of the house because like um, they're not allowed to talk about their bodies at protests. Obviously, obviously the problem with this is that trans women are not discussing their bodies at protests. They discuss their bodies elsewhere. Protest is about fighting for change. It's about gathering numbers of people and showing anger, showing that you like will destroy the, the like reigning political party at the voting booth if they do not do anything about it. Um, okay, what do they give us then about like silencing women in comparison to this? A couple of things. Firstly, um, uh, I think that the main thrust here that still stands is, is about reclamation and this kind of thing. Again, it is deeply unclear to me why this is the only avenue to reclamation around their body. We, give, we tell you that there are other ways, and they don't tell you what is unique about reclaiming it in this particular way. But also, I think that like, the problem with re reclaiming it in this way in particular is it's very unnuanced. It does not challenge the historical narratives that has already exist. And at the point at which those narratives are oppressive because other people believe in them, not the people at the protest. The people in the protest probably already believe uh, like all the feminist issues, uh, believe in all the feminist causes about bodies. Then you do not let that change the narratives of other people around you who see that like imagery and have the bias about women and their bodies and go, oh, I think that's disgusting or something like that. I think it's inappropriate. It was that nuance about who, like, who, about when you change narratives, whose minds you need to change that we give you at first that they don't respond to that wins us this issue. Okay, let me weigh this issue finally and tell you why like trans people feeling safe, trans people being included is like the most important thing in this debate. Firstly, we tell you they are deeply, deeply vulnerable. We do not, we, we can point to like trans suicide rates to show you that fe like feeling like they are excluded from one of the very few safe, the spaces where they feel safe is something that's really, really bad for them. And I think that is a massive, massive harm. The scale of the harm and the intensity which it applies to people is giant. But I think we should be comparative here to their arguments about like empowering women and stuff like that. I think the amount of empowerment that women feel from being able to do something like uh, chant about their bodies and stuff is nowhere near the amount of harm that suicidal ideation is, right? And if trans people are incredibly likely to be victim to that, we win this issue massively. Let's talk about support of the movement then. Um, I think we give you, a, 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 like, firstly, a lot of mechanisms why support is, is, is better when uh, we have more inclusivity. We also tell you about conservative backlash. I think they kind of miss the point of the argument here. They say it's better to attack, like, um, the feminist movement than other movements at second. The problem with that is the, the reasoning we give you is that it empowers conservatives to attack the trans movement, right? And they attack the trans movement because turfs are being really loud about it and because you've given them all of the like uh, ammunition they need to start convincing moderates to do things like vote for regressive trans policy because they go, oh, okay, now we understand that like, um, the, like, the feminist movement isn't about like trans rights and stuff like that. 
Um, I've already responded to this stuff about visceral imagery, so it's deeply unclear why their protests are any more effective than ours. And we give you like really clear alternatives about why our uh, really clear alternatives about talking about bodies in abstract if you do need to do that for whatever cause you're protesting about. I will add to this and say I think in fact for the people who disagree with your cause, the people who are moderates and on the fence, I think the emotion when you are really angry um, and, and showing things about bodies and stuff like that uh, and, and the kind of visual imagery that they want to talk about is probably alienating for them if they do not agree with it. So I think the comparative there then is that like another woman who isn't a feminist goes, oh, I don't really feel that way about my body and is unlikely to engage with it compared to something more abstract. I think that when you're weighing up support in this debate and thinking about the outcomes, what you need to understand is that the feminist movement does not create support by only limiting itself to the people who are already feminist. That's because feminists want to change social norms, which are wide held social beliefs, and because they want to institute policy, all of the things they say under their side of the house. That means you need to convince more people and they fail to do that. Finally, on the outcomes of the movement and why even if we don't get more support, the, the, the wins that the feminist movement can make are better under our side of the house. Firstly, we tell you that the feminist movement is not the only like party that we should be interested in, in this debate. To the point at which they harm the queer movement, to the point at which they reproduce narratives about gender essentialism, they harm that movement, we should care about it equally. Secondly, we tell you the kind of policy you're likely to get under their side of the house when you exclude trans people from the movement is one that is exclusionary to trans people. That is like, for instance, not understanding that tra like trans men often need abortion access as well, and you get policy that does not support them in accessing abortions. Finally, we tell you that the outcome of this movement is likely to be much slower and, and not very effective because because you buy into all the historical biases uh, about women and their bodies, um, and how women are like simply their bodies and nothing more. Very proud to propose. Thank you. I thank the third affirmative speaker for their fine speech, and I now welcome the third negative speaker to conclude the debate. Here, here. about the way that women have been oppressed for centuries and centuries is that their mere existence has been denied and in fact their physical presence has been continually denied and their physical presence has continually been shamed. The reality of what the opposition had to contend with was the fact that oppression for women had always been specifically biological and the oppression of cisgendered women which has been which has rep represented the majority of like women for the vast majority of history and the vast majority of the feminist feminist movement for the vast majority of its existence has been uniquely different from the experiences of trans women who have not even been recognized as trans for the vast majority of history. So what this meant was all of the progress that we needed to achieve, especially since it was so incredibly biological and so incredibly specific to this, could not get away with like women chaining themselves to like train tracks. I didn't think that was like very efficient at all or otherwise doing other things. So, three issues in this speech. First off, on women's bodies and why we should respect this. Secondly, on, on support for the feminist movement. And thirdly, on who achieves more progress. So first off, on women's bodies. I think the entirety of the opposition's case is really just centered on this claim that it is bad to associate the idea of like being a woman with like cis biological sex characteristics. What this does is they have failed to acknowledge the entirety of the material that we have continually given you down the bench. For, like for example, I think the important thing to recognize here is that you are not associating this specific biological sex characteristic of a cis woman with being a woman. One example I'll give here is I'll take them at their best and like talk about no uterus, no opinion. I think the important thing here is that obviously for like this, this like I think it is okay for trans women not to be in this specific discussion because it is a discussion about abortion more so than anything else. What this means is when we say no uterus, no opinion, we are not saying that women like abortion is uniquely a female issue, but instead it is an issue for people with uteruses. 
What this means is we enfranchise people like trans men and non-binary people as well. And this is infinitely better because this means that it is no longer specifically just a, like a female right as well, but instead just a right for people generally with uteruses. This is obviously a, like far better in terms of getting those, those policy outcomes as well, because this means you enfranchise a greater like range of the voter base, so on and so forth. But I think the other part of this also is that they fail to acknowledge that like trans women also deserve to talk about their unique bodies and it is only when you start this discussion that they now feel comfortable doing this. If we take the opposition at their best and acknowledge this idea that like apparently trans women represent a very small fraction of like the like you know giant like feminist like voter base so on and so forth, I think it is incredibly important that we get these discussions started and create spaces where it is okay to talk about these things, where it is okay for women to be crude and like disgusting and so on and so forth and acknowledge the reality of their bodies and so on and so forth. So I think the, uh, the, then we get this push about like how like trans women then like perceive this as like gender equivalent, like being equivalent to looks, so on and so forth. I think the important thing to acknowledge is again, as we've continually told you down and down the bench, is that biology is just biology, as this movement specifically establishes. But I think looks entirely is separate as well. And in fact, I think this is actually like better just like disseminated in terms of this idea of like a specific feminine look. When you say that like specific feminine looks do not exist and specific feminine biology does not exist, but we can embrace the fact that like a lot of women have these specific characteristics characteristics and that is perfectly fine. So then moving on to the idea of like support for the fe feminist movement. The main push that the opposition tries to give is that trans women will, or will immediately leave the movement because they feel disenfranchised because the definition of what, what a woman is is specifically like having a vagina and so on and so forth. A couple of reasons why they will still stay in the movement. First off, I think it's important to note that there are still many other issues within the feminist movement that are directly relevant to them and that will not be addressed by any other movement. For example, that looks like things like sexual assault. Obviously, there, there are like slightly different nuances in this type, probably in the types of way that cis women versus trans women are assaulted. But I think probably like cis women and trans women are sexually assaulted in more similar ways than like men are assaulted, for example. It is far better that they get this progress within this movement. But I think the other thing to also recognize is that trans women, like trans people, and trans women specifically, have oftentimes been disenfranchised by all the other movements that they belong to. For example, like the LGBT movement, where there is like rampant transphobia throughout the entirety of the movement. So what this means is that it is far more likely that they will stay within the feminist movement and instead like fit in here instead. I think the other thing to also recognize is that even if there are certain issues that are specific to having uteruses or specific to having certain types of biology, there is still a large portion of the feminist movement that is talking about general policy in terms of like thinking about things like, you know, like how like women and men like interact within the workplace or like how women and men like are like hired differently and the standards for like education, so on and so forth, that still like exist, that still exist and are still issues for both types of women. Um, I think it is still like possible that they can start to stay within here. The other thing also, in terms of this idea of the narrative, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are other parts of the movement as well. I think, for example, observe that at protests, like women all have like different priorities. They'll probably have like slightly different posters, so on and so forth. And it is still an important part of the narrative that we should be acknowledging. I think even like taking them out there, like even like acknowledging like perhaps our worst case scenario where we maybe exclude some trans women. I think the important thing to acknowledge is exactly as they say, trans women represent a very small portion. And if we have to trade off like some trans women leaving the like movement with like getting abortion rights and getting healthcare rights, so on and so forth fully happy to do this. We still enfranchise lots of women, lots of trans men, lots of non-binary people, so happy to do this. Then we tell you that protests can be incredibly nuanced and that like this nuance increases when you increase the types of discussion that are going on. When you no longer have to restrict your like discussions and restrict your words to what you have conventionally taught that like women have to restrict their words to within like the public sphere, but instead you can be crude and talk about whatever you want to do. I think the other thing to also recognize is that like this like they tell us that this can only happen before and after protests so on and so forth i think you can still have speeches at protests and still have like people talking to each other at protests as well in fact i think that it is exactly the sort of female camaraderie that is like immediately established when you're immediately able to relate to people because this like subject that has been like stigmatized and like regarded as taboo for so long like women not being allowed to talk about their periods because it's disgusting so on and so forth you're able to do this and this sort of camaraderie is better embraced by this sort of thing Okay, then like lastly, in terms of the idea of like trans people, once more, I think it's important to note that like the trans, like the female feminist movement has like tra tra traditionally been quite inclusive of other people as well. But the other thing in terms of inclusivity is that we encourage a greater range of inclusivity because note that it, like specifically with cis women as well, who represent the vast majority of the feminist movement, there are still many divisions within this movement that make it very difficult to mobilize everyone together. That's things like class, that's things like race, so on and so forth, that affect the differences in how women access different things. I think healthcare, the uniquely things like abortion and sexual assault so on and so forth a way we can like mobilize a greater portion of that entire voter base if that means we can get more policy fully willing to accept anything's there okay then lastly in terms of progress 
You hear a lot about the conservative movement, so on and so forth. A couple of things here. First off, I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't want to absorb any people into the movement that are explicitly going to harm the movement. For example, if they are going to be sex negative, I don't think that is something that is that is obviously something that is not only going to be affecting the way that they talk, but also the sorts of policies that they're going to propose. If they hate the fact that women are talking about their vaginas, that probably means that they aren't very like pro periods and like getting rid of period attacks, so on and so forth. That is obviously going to affect the movement, and so that means that you can't get those sorts of like policy changes that we are so like desperately advocating for. But apart from that, note that like in terms of this idea of like broad support from moderates, I think they need to recognise that like the reality was women represented 50% of the voting population. You could fully like just mobilise this and get a lot of progress. There was no need to really appeal to the moderates, specifically because the moderates were not women. Like I think male moderates were not women, and what this meant was that women issues were not probably not at the forefront of their minds. Even if they were like, oh, I like the fact that the feminist movement is no longer attacking me, and so maybe I'll like be a little bit nicer to women. That doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden going to be so like incredibly pro-abortion that they start like advocating for like left policies that will now like also mean that like voting for left parties that will also mean that they have to sacrifice some sort of like employment rights or so on and so forth. Lastly in terms of being crude and angry and like this idea that they can still have visceral imagery I think this was like quite like concessionary in terms of like the fact that like at the they also wanted visceral imagery so on and so forth but this visceral imagery was obviously useless for all of the reasons that we gave you at first in terms of why it was so specifically important that women were allowed to talk about their bodies as they had been historically told not to throughout the entirety of history so because we got imagery that was specific because we ensured better inclusivity because we ensured publicity and all of these mechanisms that meant that we got more progress and more joinership for the feminist movement so proud to oppose <laughs> Congratulate both teams on a fine debate. Um, I'd invite the teams to cross the floor and shake and then head back to the briefing room with the audience. Um, we will deliver the results as soon as we are ready. Cheers, <laughs> Is that your final? No, that's awesome. No. <laughs>